Welcome, everyone. I would like to speak today about the principles of evolutionary astrology in order to better understand what it stands for, especially today as this practice keeps expanding and more and more people adopt this approach around the world. So myself and Stephen Forrest compose nine guidelines that can help practitioners better understand how to use it and what it stands for. Originally, Stephen Forrest and Jeffrey Green had a list of guidelines, but now in the 21st century, it's time to recalibrate and adapt this to our current times. Evolutionary astrology first came about, you know, the term itself by a fellow astrologer named Ray Merriman, who wrote a book with this title, but he abandoned this approach and became a financial astrologer. So the main teachers, Stephen Forrest and Jeffrey Green, developed this approach based on their own spiritual experience and building on astrologers such as Dane Rudyard, who emerged from the theosophical movement of the late 19th century. And as you will understand as we go through these guidelines, this is a spiritual approach to astrology that doesn't only look at the psychological development, but at the soul. Soul means that we are developing our consciousness and that we're not just looking at life from the spectrum of what happened in this life and early childhood dynamics, but from a soul point of view, we encompass uh, past lives as well. So I was personally uh, a student of Jeffrey Green and over the years developed my own body of knowledge and approach to this practice. So welcome and let's dive in. So the, <clears throat> the nine principles themselves were composed by the both of us as we practice it. And then the explanations are coming from me. I want to highlight that because if there's anything you don't feel you agree with, just don't blame him. Come to me. <laughs> so this helps us understand you know, the ins and out of evolutionary astrology. It's a magnificent system, but it is diverse. And um, it's also a philosophy, an approach to astrology, even more so than a specific technique. And that's what I want to get into. The reason also I um, would like to present this video as many of you already know, I teach an extensive diploma program in evolutionary astrology. Of course, I encourage all of you to join because it's a very deep body of knowledge. And frankly, the world does need more astrologers. So the focus of this program on evolutionary astrology helps us uh, get to the bottom line as much as possible using astrology to, I would say, com compact in one consultation what some people may process over 10 consultation with a psychotherapist. So it really goes to the soul. And that's one of the most, I would say, important component of evolutionary astrology is that we are not only getting into the psychology, understanding our patterns, our conditioning, which is very important, but we're incorporating the soul. And that means also prior lives. And this provides a context that offers a wider, broader perspective on the things that a person may go through. Not everything can be traced to early childhood, and I'm going to get into that. So let's explore. Let's dive in and 
hopefully gain greater understanding. So the first principle is that, <clears throat> you know, as an opening statement, the universe is a conscious, intelligent, and ultimately benevolent design that fosters the evolution of consciousness despite the inevitable intermittent experience of suffering, which is integral to life's experience. So this, you know, is a premise that it's extremely important because if the universe is random, then we cannot learn anything from it. You know, there would be no cohesion. Things could not make sense. Uh, there wouldn't be any repeating pattern and we wouldn't be able to learn about anything. So the fact that the in, the universe is intelligent <clears throat> makes us able to gradually gain greater and greater understanding, expand our science, but also learn on a day-to-day -day basis. And when I say conscious, I see the universe um, as conscious. And I would say, you know, if we want to apply this to our dimension here, everything in nature is conscious, you know, beginning with human beings, but everything alive is conscious, including animals, including vegetation. So I, you know, <clears throat> I can share some of my experiences where uh, I can see all of nature, even what we don't consider alive, being conscious. And I, my most vivid example is when I was living in Hawaii and we were um, on, the, on the borders of an active volcano. And the local Hawaiian uh, population living on the flanks of the volcano would communicate with the volcano, with the goddess of the volcano, Pele. And I could not tell you how often prayers would divert the flow of the lava. You know, um, when the lava was coming to town and everybody was packing and evacuating because of the threat of being basically burned to the stake, um, the lava ended up stopping exactly where the previous day children had posted their prayers. Things like that. So, you know, we can argue this is nothing scientific, but from an evolutionary point of view, we understand that intelligence comes with consciousness. And how do we know it is benevolent? So an explanation of all this, we speak about evolutionary evolution. Where are we evolving? We look at life. The process of evolution is to realize the all encompassing universal truth. So, this is the only constant, whether you lived in the Middle Age, whether you lived in, <clears throat> you know, in the cave times, whether you live now, the truth is the truth. It is constant. So the laws of physics, the way the universe is conducted, remains beyond time, beyond culture, beyond any individual bias. It's an objective system. Some will say, but, you know, the truth is relative. What someone experiences in Alaska is different from what another person experiences in the desert. Yes, there is on a human level, a relative truth. And that is because our consciousness hasn't realized the all-encompassing truth. So we see portions, and each person has one piece of that puzzle. You know, there's a big puzzle, but each one has a piece of that puzzle. And each of these pieces are real, but they're only a fraction of the greater 
all-encompassing universal truth. So speaking about truth, the more we evolve our consciousness, the more we can harmonize, understand that living by the truth will make our lives better. So truth is one for all. It's immutable, it's eternal, and it is still. But the truth is veiled. You know, we get only bits and pieces. And therefore, we need to continue evolve our consciousness. Our perception is incomplete. Our consciousness is not in a state of perfection. And this is why we are in an evolutionary process and we are constantly growing. We are in motion. If the truth is still and it is permanent, eternal, our evolution is not still. We're constantly changing forms. That is because we keep expanding the vessel, our cup. Um, from an evolutionary point of view, we have the container of our consciousness. How much can we take in? And what can we integrate? You know, it's one thing to evolve, but you have to be able to digest it. You have to be able to integrate what you are learning. And this only happens through the emotional body. So the container, what you can actually absorb, your, your soul stomach is your emotional body. And as you continue evolving, you expand your vessel so that you may understand greater portions of the truth. And from my perspective, the outer planets are about that. Pluto is the vessel of consciousness. And it's about expanding that vessel. So Pluto destroys and rebuilds. Uranus is the consciousness itself. Uranus represents our ability to know. Aha, to realize that higher truth. And then Neptune represents all that there is, what we know and what we don't know. It's, it's that eternal truth and our relationship to it. So is the universe benef benevolent? You know, there's so much suffering. We see so much injustice, children abused. Um, to name but a few, you know, the innocent, the, the vulnerable ones being <clears throat> harmed. So, you know, how can we believe that the universe is benevolent if we had genocides, if, you know, there's so much pain. You know, ultimately, from a big picture perspective, if the universe wasn't benevolent, there would not be solutions to problems. Suffering would never end. And we would eventually completely self-destroy. So that is part of the premise that because there are solutions and because suffering leads to looking for solutions, uh, we eventually get to the point where we can resolve problems, <clears throat> excuse me, and feel better. So suffering prompts us to make the efforts to find solutions. And the search for a solution as we are in those most difficult situations that stimulates evolution. And, and I'm talking about looking for solutions for yourself, the same way you look for solutions for others. You know, if we speak about um, harm being done to vulnerable populations, to children, even if they're not looking for the solution, someone is. And we are wired that way, that we can uh, that we want to look for answers, that we're not satisfied with um, suffering. The second <clears throat> guideline is that nothing 
happens randomly in life, whether through success or adversity. There is a higher evolutionary purpose behind everything in our lives. So this goes back to the fact that there is an intelligent design, that it's not just random occurrences that have nothing to do with each other. And, and so whether you, you know, win the lottery or whether you find your soulmate and you feel grateful about everything you have in your life or whether you feel diminished, limited, or victimized, um, there is an evolutionary context. So every life experiences experience contributes to the greater aim of realizing the truth. When you have success, then you know what feels good. You know what must be done to have an enduring, enduring experience of well-being. You know, it's not enough to say, I feel good for an hour and then I feel depressed. You know, that's what drugs do. They give you a high at the expense of a crash. So we're talking here about when you evolve your consciousness, it's about elevating your life experience and having long-term results. Seem, it may seem absurd that innocent, helpless, and good people suffer. It seems unjust if, if the system is benevolent. But we must remember that evolutionary lessons apply also to the good-hearted and to the innocent. We have to be very careful with this guideline to avoid using this in a form that is victim blaming. For example, saying to someone that they were abused because they acted inappropriately and there's an evolutionary lesson, you know, you, you, you were robbed or you were abused because um, this, that, and the other, you didn't do this, that, and the other. I mean, how can you say that to a child, you know, that is innocent? We look at the soul. So there is a context, there is a past life. And the purpose of looking at the evolutionary context is not to blame. It is to provide tools of understanding so that whoever is in a compromised situation can realize that they have choices, that they're not as helpless as they thought they were. So evolving your consciousness is an empowering process ultimately. It is not about, um, you know, using this in a, in a detrimental way. And astrologers have to be very careful, especially evolutionary astrologers, because we are dealing, you know, with the, with consciousness and with evolutionary lessons you know, you have some astrologers who who come to a consultation in a very uh, intellectual way and, you know, can make these assumptions without really understanding the suffering, the helplessness of their client. Now, why aren't you divorcing your partner? You know, it's a bad relationship. It's bad karma. Uh, it's your fault. You're staying. And, uh, you know, and you deserve the suffering because you're not learning your lessons. Sounds awful, but it is being said. So as consultant, we need to understand that it takes time to evolve our consciousness, to realize uh, the things. And it's not enough to know things intellectually. We need to integrate that emotionally. So that's why I said evolution occurs through the emotional body, not through the intellectual body. The intellectual body is the first step of perception. It's the radar, but the actual 
plan of action is going to be through the emotional integration. That's when it really gets into your bloodstream. So, you know, a lesson could be to learn about boundaries, to learn about developing defenses, to each their story. You know, there's no one story that will fit a situation. That's why we have a chart with its unique alignments. So the more conscious we become, the more empowered we can be because we then proceed with life more intentionally. And so finding our evolution, finding out about, you know, our evolutionary lesson can empower us because once we know we can overcome helplessness and maybe avoid harm, we can gain better control of our lives. Again, consciousness allows for intentional participation. So again, we all experience suffering. It doesn't matter how enlightened we are or we think we are. There's always a blind spot. There's always something that missing from view. And we are all vulnerable to not know, you know, to, to, to make the wrong alliance, to open the wrong door. You know, it's it's part of the journey. Sometimes we need to learn the hard way. So the process of evolution extends through numerous lifetimes and the natal chart in its entirety describes where we are at in the evolutionary course and our next steps intended for the current incarnation. You know, the question is, you know, why do we need past lives? Like, why can't we just focus on what's coming up next? You know, seems more practical. But from an evolutionary point of view, going to past lives gives you an ability to dive deeper into the origins of certain patterns. So somebody can ask, when will I get married? And I can look at a date when Venus, you know, is, is doing its dance and landing in the right spot in the chart and say, you know, that's a good time to meet someone or a good time to get married. But that, doesn't guarantee that the relationship will be a good one, doesn't guarantee that this marriage will last. So when we go back into early life or past life, it's not just because, you know, we want to waste the client's time. It's to, it's to provide context and it's to give perspective on the present, what's happening now is indeed what's important. But if you want to have a really uh, empowering, good experience in the now, you need to learn where you're coming from. So that's the beauty of astrology is that it fuses past, present, and future into one chart. Um, so I'm going to say, you know, evolutionary astrology traces current circumstances to early life, childhood, and then past life experiences. We see patterns. And once you understand patterns, you can either enhance them or break them if they're serving you or not. But what is important is not to just Talk about the symptoms, talk about the surface of, you know, look at the top of the iceberg. Yes, you're going to meet someone that date. We want to look at the as much as possible what's under uh, the surface and see what is feeding those relationships, those behaviors, those needs. You know, why haven't you find anyone until now? Are you meant to even get married, you know, in a traditional way? 
And if so, what type of relationship would work best for you? What do you need to be careful about? All these things have to be unpacked, understood, so that if you are in that auspicious alignment when you could meet you know, a sweetheart, it's going to be someone who meets you at your best. You know, again, an intentional activation. So our past lives, we don't remember them. They're mostly in our unconscious. And through evolutionary astrology, we strive to go beyond the current circumstances, you know, what the, what is in front of us, the ego reality, to trace the soul journey. Now, the thing is, can astrology really go back into past lives? Are there a past life? Is past life a real thing? So all these questions, I can say from my experience, yes, there are past lives. Because you can see the soul age is different from your chronological age. You know, you may be 12 year old as being born 12 years ago, but you may be 100 years old from a soul point of view. And that will mean that sometimes young people will be much more mature than seniors so when we see that not everybody is born with a blank slate not everybody is born with the same level of maturity with the same type of consciousness we understand that it didn't just start now um, but can astrology really go into past lives? My experience is yes. And I've looked at different examples. I'm actually going to, I'm teaching this in the curriculum of the course, how to identify those past lives. And this has to be done very responsibly because it's easily misused. So there are verifications. There are ways to actually validate if a person did go through something in a past life or not. It's not always the case, but in many cases it is. So astrology, to me, and that's my premise, is a reliable tool to explore past lives. So we're not just looking at, you know, whether you were blonde and five or six feet tall in your past life. We're looking at the themes that you're working with. You know, did you come from a past life where you were um, a leader? You know, and you come and you have expectations to lead right away. Do you come from past lives where you were persecuted and you have anxiety that is cannot be explained by your early childhood you know you had childhood that was for the most part fine but you have this fear of uniforms or fear of um success you know how many people have a fear of being visible and they want to hide and they don't know why and that can be sometimes traced to persecution so these are people who are constantly under the radar they don't want to be seen. They don't want to be successful. They don't want to create because there's a past life wound associated with that. So that's why it's important. And that's why astrology can be so revealing. So many of our issues cannot be traced to childhood alone and to genetics and to cultural conditioning that's you know why we want to go to the deeper origins of certain experiences and patterns 
for a better present. You know, always remember, it's not about storytelling. It's not about, you know, I, I remember I was one time uh, having body work and this person really could tap into past lives. And, I, you know, and I said, ask him, you know, what are you tapping into? What do you see in my case? And he was like, you know, you don't need to know. You know, you don't need to know that all these difficult uh, situations, because it can be, re you can be re-traumatized. So we need to be careful how we use this knowledge. But the most important thing is that it serves our present. You know, is it going to help me to know this? Is it going to solve some of my issues? So all, unlike early life dynamics, we cannot empirically, for the most part, verify past life. If I tell you you were persecuted, well... How do you know? Well, you see it in the chart. Yeah, but you cannot confirm it. The same way you can confirm uh, with someone that, you know, they they experienced a loss in their childhood, that their parents divorced, or that their father was very controlling. You know, they will say yes or no. So then you know you're on track. But past life is abstract. How can you verify it? Um, unless you're a psychic, you can't immediately verify it. One thing you can do is to definitely have validation from, okay, I see this pattern in the chart. And my experience as, as the person who lives this chart is that it makes total sense. You know, it, it, crosses those T's, it resolves a puzzle for me. So part of your validation is what how the client feels about it, if it lands or not. And sometimes it won't land, but once they re-listen to the recording of your session, they'll say, well, now that I think about it, it does make sense. And that's also why, as a practitioner, we we need to offer, you know, to, to speak about past life as suggestions, as themes, and not play God. You know, we speak about influences. It needs to remain abstract to some degree because... Astrology doesn't give you, at least as far as I know, doesn't give you the resolution to get into, you know, a hundred percent definition of what really happened. So you see a theme, and that's enough to help the person in their circumstance. And like I said, there are ethical consideration in analyzing past lives. You must remember not to do to do no harm. You know, uh, you were a murderer. You know, you were an assassin in a past life, or you were a tyrant or whatnot. You know, all these things that can sometimes be said too loosely and without real confirmation um, is dangerous. So always. See, are you really sure that what you say is necessary? Are you really sure that what you say is true? And are you really sure that what you say is going to help? And you may say, you know, there's a suggestion here of such and such um, in a way that can be, again, helpful. That's what you want to be. You want to be helpful. So when you look into past lives, you're not just learning astrology and 
how the patterns, you know, can tell you this or that story. But you also have to understand history. You know, you need the context of where did we come from? You know, we come from World War II. How many people, you know, if you counsel people who have a Jewish origin um, and you see signatures that suggest loss, you know, knowing history, you can tie that to maybe having been in the Holocaust. So you have to understand human right movement. You know, um, it, it's it's different to have a chart if you're a woman than you if you're a man, because looking at history, women couldn't didn't have the liberties, didn't have the you know the social rights and the permission uh, to lead and, and to educate themselves the same way men did. So you need to know that historically in order to analyze those themes of the past chart more effectively. That's, you know, astrologers need to know life from a spiritual point of view, from a practical point of view, uh, we're learning about the soul journey in many, many, through many layers. This is the chart of a client. Um, and so it's a it's a woman who, as you can see in her seventh house, there are quite intense signatures, uh, Mars conjunct Saturn, Pluto, you know, in, in that seventh house, and they all square her sun. And so, you know, when I look at this chart, I can see that the whole chart represents where she's coming from, from a soul point of view. And therefore, I can see that there were struggles, power struggles, possibly violence with Mars Saturn in the seventh house in past lives. Now, this lady, you know, was a teenager and then a young woman and her parents really pressured her to get married. She has Venus in Capricorn conjunct Jupiter and Neptune, and they, you know, wanted the traditional package of do, you know, find the right person, have kids, get a job, and, and lead a normal life. And she would listen, and yet she found, quote unquote, no one who she felt she could marry. And it's obvious from an evolutionary point of view, if we look just at her life, she was born into a traditional family. You know, yes, the mom was, you know, had her own issues and the father had her own issues. And just like any family, they were uh, there were moments of intensity and there were moments of normalcy, but there was nothing extremely dramatic in the relationship of her parents um, that would suggest a trauma. You know, they didn't divorce. Uh, they didn't throw plates at each other. There was no violence. There was no um break up or loss. And so these seventh house signatures were not fully anchored in her early life scenario, but it's obvious that she did not feel safe in relationships. And that part of her not getting married was just that. She 
did not want to repeat that past life pattern. And she didn't know, like from her point of view, she didn't know why it never worked out, why she didn't find the right one. She didn't realize that she was actually in an avoidance pattern and that there is a past life memory of trauma, of violence that um, activated certain patterns of defense and self-protection and good for her because had she rushed into marriage, she could have repeated, you know, those intense power struggles. And that's what evolutionary astrology can help with, is provide context, is to understand you're not crazy. You know, you're, you know, you're very attractive, you're smart. It's just that there's a lesson here in taking a step back, in reclaiming your sense of power before you can re-engage more deeply and safely with relationships. So the circumstances here with her Venus in Capricorn and conjunct Jupiter and Neptune in the ninth house is that she was um, in arranged marriages based on religious um, conditioning. So, you know, she belonged in past life to religious movements that chose for her who to marry. And that's obviously, you know, uh, led to abuse and challenges in the relationship. And now she's saying, I don't want any of it. And nobody is going to force me into marriage. <clears throat> and if they have, and if they try, there's going to be a passive aggressive uh, avoidance pattern. So um, what we see here is that the whole chart, not only the nodes, the whole chart describes where we're coming from. Next principle, every chart represents a spectrum of possibility, and we have the free will to express it more or less consciously. So, you know, the way I like to say it is that we cannot change our chart. We are fated to our chart, but we have the free will to make the best of it because as we look at an astrology chart, it looks like a two-dimensional flat wheel and the planets keep going in circles, you know, through the signs. But in reality, if we speak about evolution, we are actually spiraling up and down, up to the heights and down to the depth. So the same chart, the same cycle, if you look from above, it can look as though you're repeating, you know, chasing your tail, going in circles. But if you look, you know, from a horizontal point of view, you start to see that there are layers and layers and that you're actually spiraling up and down. Why is that important? It's because free will means that you can be more conscious and intentionally use your chart in a different way, whether you know astrology or not. You know, consciousness is not tied to astrology. Astrology is just a tool to help you become more conscious. But you can do that through many other means and exercises. So the more conscious you are, the more free will you can develop. And think about it historically. We live now, you know, I talked in my video about um, the evolution of relationships, the River of Star series. And in that video, I speak about the evolution of relationship, of how, you know, we come from a time where we did not have free will <clears throat> culturally, and things were decided for us. 
you know, people got married because someone told them, because the family made the decision, because there was a practical reason. Most people did not get married because they were in love. So when you don't have free will, you know, there's fate. Something decides for you. And as you develop your free will, you can elevate the use of your child. You can make more intentional decisions. And this is why um, people who have the same chart or pretty much the same chart can have similar challenges, but they're not necessarily going to make the same decisions. And we see that clearly with twins, biological twins, who are born in the same genetics, same family. And if they're born by cesarean, they're also born within a minute of each other. And yet they are not the same person. They have different souls. And the soul can be at, you know, vastly different levels of evolution, different levels of consciousness. So one will operate that chart on the higher level of the spiral and the other one on a lower level of the spiral. So that, you know, takes us back to we can use our chart differently. We are not locked into patterns. You know, if you have Saturn square your Mercury, um, you can feel as though you're self-conscious. You're afraid of saying something stupid. You can be told that you're not smart. You know, you can be in circumstances where you are scrutinized and you feel self-conscious. But the more you become aware of this, the more uh, perspective you gain on these patterns, you, the more you can overcome this. And lo and behold, you can see people with Saturn square Mercury who will be silent and who will afraid, who will be afraid to say anything in fear of judgment. And you will see those who are going to be geniuses because one of the things that Saturn provide is structure. It's the understanding of patterns. And so they can elevate the frequency of that same aspect to a more healed, to a more conscious expression and use the Mercury Saturn to be very precise with their words, to be very um, intentional with their communication. And they will do research that requires more rigor and hopefully, you know, get better result, gain credibility. So the same chart signature doesn't doom you to a one level story. That's part of the virtues of uh, evolutionary astrology is that you can express your chart at a higher level. And that's part of what you're here to do, actually. That's part of the sole purpose is to resolve the challenges of your chart. Now, we're looking here at another example. This fellow is a Capricorn sun, conjunct Venus, and born with this, you know, 
intense opposition to Mars, Saturn, exactly conjunct. Then his moon is right on the MC in Virgo. So a lot of Earth. And you may say someone, you know, with a lot of Earth will naturally be practical, um, hardworking, um, and, and methodical you know, in what they do. And, you know, they're, they're going to be matter of fact, they're going to be perhaps more traditional, especially, you know, Mars Saturn wants to do things right. And the sun in Capricorn opposing Saturn. Again, can, can reflect a lot of dilemmas about what they want to do with their lives. Um, likely, you know, because it's in the ninth house and third house education, they may want to study something that will provide um, a good job, you know, guarantee for a secure position. With the moon in Virgo, maybe they're going to want to be doctors, you know, in the healing fields. Or maybe they're going to be, you know, involved with building and infrastructure. And of course, you can unpack this and go more and more uh, into details. And so, indeed, you know, analyzing this chart two dimensionally can lead to uh, that scenario where this person is going to study law, study. Um, to be a teacher, study to be a doctor, and have a good job and be hardworking and, you know, provide a service that, you know, is going to have a lot of credibility in society. And yet, this chart actually is the chart of David Lynch, the film director, who could not be more eccentric than, you know, uh, what he's doing. If some of you are familiar with his work, it's diving into it's things that are completely abstract, imagination, and he is nothing but traditional. Um, so he's a director. And that's part of the Capricorn. You know, Capricorn like to direct things. And he is extremely meticulous. Like that Virgo moon is clinical in its atmospheres and details about the way he produces things. But he's taking that Capricorn and Virgo, not to the level of pleasing critics or wanting to be traditional and be, you know, you know, have a respectable job in society. He is more evolved in his consciousness to transcend, you know, this need for valid for public validation. And he is someone who is actually, you know, not going for ratings, not going for um, popularity and for the conservative formula. Even as a film director, you know, he's not going to do the cookie cutter stuff. <clears throat> but from a Capricorn point of view, he takes his job extremely seriously. And for him, his standards are very high. His level of performance is very high. But to a higher standard of truth, of authenticity. So we can say his soul age is above the average mainstream. And that's why this chart is nothing but conservative, even though the symbol of conservatism are so prominent. That's something that evolutionary astrology provides, is understanding 
you know, the different levels of the spiral. The same chart can apply on a very basic level or it can apply on a higher, more sophisticated, deeper level of consciousness. And until you meet him and you actually speak to him, you won't know. Because the chart doesn't reveal the soul age. It only tells you what kind of energies you're working with. And that takes us to our next guidelines. Willingly reaching towards higher possibilities promised in your chart leads us towards increasing well-being. So, you know, that's the question. Like, why bother evolving? Why all this hard work? Why can't we just uh, keep it simple, repeat the same pattern, get a formula and stick to it? Why this spiral? Because the more conscious you are, the greater your chance to improve your quality of life. And I don't mean that financially. I mean that on a, on all layers. So... It's not, you know, an immediate formula that, you know, the more conscious you are, the happier you are always. And, you know, um, you'll never suffer. But what it does mean is that if you understand the greater truth, if you are in tune with the pulse of the universe, if you are harmonizing with what is beyond your egocentric self, you can better adapt. You can better respond to life's challenges. So the evolution of consciousness has for purpose to lead eventually, ultimately better life, to be more whole and to increase our well-being. The more conscious we become, the more aligned we are with the truth, the more we can harmonize with existence and we can decrease the intensity of suffering. So suffering is still going to challenge us. But how long are you going to suffer? Is it going to be a lifetime? Is it going to be, are you going to get it faster? Chances are you are. There are, of course, exceptions we are talking here about general guidelines. But consciousness helps you navigate existence more holistically and hopefully uh, with greater resonance. So suffering exists on all levels. We've said this. No one is above suffering. And as you resolve one thing, as you learn a lesson, you know, soon enough, a new one shows up. So your blind spots are constantly showing. So what is well-being? You know, you said it's not ephemeral. It's not just about having a high and then followed by a crash. Because that's easy. You know, how many people win the lottery and then end up beggars because they you know they're not doing it intentionally they they squander their resources so what is well-being having love and trust in our lives you know these are some of notes that i believe uh can lead us towards an understanding of what well-being is and i'm by no mean that's a perfect list and by no mean it's a complete list but it's something to think about having love and trust in your life you know people who care about you and you caring about people in your life and being able to have trust having meaning and purpose and motivation you know knowing that you want to do things with your life that you, you know, that you have faith in what's coming up and in your abilities. Being fairly mobile and physically able, you know, if you are able to move your hands and your feet, you, you can do more with your life, perhaps 
that contributes to well-being. And we can have the example of Stephen Hawkins or, you know, people born with, you know, the condition where they have no limbs who are extremely physically limited, but yet they also find a way to have purpose, meaning, and to find love in their life. So mobility helps. It's not an absolute, but um, feeling comfortable in your body is important. Being able to find meaning in the struggle. So it's, you know, being in, being well doesn't mean you don't struggle, but it means that you find there's a purpose to your struggle. There's a meaning to your struggle. You make something out of your struggles. And you're able to resolve problems within a reasonable amount of time. So again, you have problems. We all do. But the more you are in that well-being, the more perhaps accessible are the solutions or the more at peace you can be with your situation. And another factor of well-being is the ability to not just resolve problems, but to avoid some of them. You know, if you're seeing a precipice in front of you, turn left or right. And that is summarizing, you know, how consciousness, the evolution of our consciousness can make a difference in how we lead our lives and how we can improve our conditions. To the next slide, <clears throat> next guideline, the horoscope does not reveal anyone's level of consciousness. And that's where, you know, we talked about this when we looked at David Lynch chart. We don't see on what level this chart is going to operate. We need to understand what astrology can and cannot do. So the, the chart, the horoscope does not reveal the gender. You know, is it a man, a woman? Is it a goat? Is it an event? What is this chart about? You know, are they Muslim, Christians, atheists? This is context. In order for you, for all of us, to make astrology work, we need context. And that's why we need a rapport with our client. If you just get a piece of paper, like I said, it could be the chart of the spider on your wall. <clears throat> and you're not going to read it the same way that you would for a person. The same way, the chart does not reveal the soul age of the person and what level of consciousness they operate. So where on that spiral they are at, no way to know but to interact with them. And when you have that context, you're a man, you're born in the 21st century, you know, under this kind of conditioning, then I can apply the chart to your context. And hopefully, um, give you guidance that matches where you're at. Because why is the level of consciousness important? If you were going back to David Lynn's chart and you were just looking at this flat piece of paper without knowing who the context of this person, you would tell them, you know, you need a secure job and <clears throat> maybe you're gonna be, you know, doing administration because that's a career of a moon in Virgo in the 10th house. And, you know, you need to get a diploma that re represents that. <clears throat> and you, you're not taking into consideration that this person 
has already covered ground, you know, that they're already <clears throat> exploring life from a much different vantage point, that they have deeper understanding, <clears throat> you are not going to be able to help them. <clears throat> and your, your reading will fail. So take into consideration, this is one of the things in my program that we really <clears throat> focus hard on because it makes a huge difference. Um, it makes your readings more accurate. So only upon interacting with a person can we estimate, estimate, you know, you may not be certain, but at least you can have a sense of what the level of consciousness is. You know, will a Taurus be consumed by their immediate need for material indulgence, or will they devote themselves to create financially sustainable economy? Will they be attracted to superficial appearances and, you know, how do I look and, and what to wear constantly or develop sensitive perceptions of <clears throat> sacred geometry in nature? So the same chart placements can show in different frequency of expression. And that requires training to know how do I identify that? <clears throat> you know, I was personally trained um, by Jeffrey Wolf Green, and he was heavily influenced by Dane Rudyard, who first came up with the, the description of the levels of consciousness in his book, Astrology of Transformation. And even though it's not a complete, you know, perfect model, it does provide, you know, very deep um, understanding of what happens when you evolve your consciousness, when you move from, you know, one spiral circle to another, and how your vision of reality changes. Chart placements are neutral in their quality, representing the evolutionary design and path of a person. No chart is doomed to suffering, or no chart is guaranteed success because no placement is inherently good or bad. So the lucky chart or the cursed chart is not applicable to evolutionary astrology as we practice it. Nature is diverse. Everything is integral to a healthy ecosystem. The same way every chart configuration is part of nature's intelligence. There is no square, there is no trine, there is no you know, house that is better than another. The same way that your brain is not better than your shoulder or is not better than your liver. They each have a necessary role. So... That is the interdependence of all the chart components. And we need to come as astrologers, as evolutionary astrologer, without the bias of this is good, this is bad. Because the moment you project that uh, quantifying thing before you put consciousness to it, you are basically at the risk of not reading the chart accurately. As we said, someone can have a Mars square, excuse me, a Saturn square Mercury. How will we know if they're going to be depressed all their lives, if they're going to feel stupid all their lives, or if they're going to be incredible geniuses? And sometimes a little bit of both. You know, you can have the depressive side, you can have the self-conscious side, and you can have brilliance. <clears throat> That's consciousness. This is why there is no pattern in your chart that dooms you to suffering. There is no one who can tell you, no astrologer can tell you, 
your relationships will never give you love, that you are doomed to loneliness. No one can tell you you are doomed to poverty. The same way that no one can guarantee you'll be on top of your game or stay there. <clears throat> you know, you can have chart pattern that represent fast success, but how many people experience fast success? And if they don't have consciousness, if they don't have awareness, they end up doing drugs, they end up misusing their power and going downhill from there. You need to apply consciousness. And that's what determines if the chart is going to be beneficial or not. Now, there are definitely chart placements that will be more challenging than others. You know, if you're born with intensely <clears throat> aligned planets, yes, you have more on your plate. Uh, there can be more stress earlier on, at least. And we're not saying all charts are created equal. But what we are saying is that each chart is there for a reason, for a good reason. Each chart is part of the nature complex. There's no wrong chart. There's no bad chart. There are more intense and less intense charts, for sure, just like there are more intense lives and more casual ones. So evolutionary astrology does not consider a priority and, and some practitioners not at all. <clears throat> planetary exaltations, detriments, or planetary joys where a planet feels good in a sign or feels good in a house versus another. Because we come from the perspective that each Placement is neutral, it's energy. And consciousness will determine if you use it well or not. And I'm using here the example of Mars. You know, in many astrology systems, Mars is considered debilitated, detriment, uncomfortable in cancer. And yet the most decorated Olympic swimmer, Phelps, has an angular, not angular, but angular, Mars in Cancer. So he managed to take his Mars in Cancer and become the best swimmer. It's obviously a water sign, and Mars has to do with athletic capacity. So he managed to basically um, use that Mars in a benevolent way. And the opposite, you know, when some system will consider Mars in Capricorn as exalted, you know, more effective, yet it shows in the chart of, you know, people who are intensely repressed and sometimes tyrannical, people who can abuse their power and even sexually deviant. I mean... Woody Allen has Mars in Capricorn and Venus in its own sign of Libra. And you examine his pattern of relationships. And by all means, you know, whether whatever the allegations are confirmed or not, his relationship patterns are not exalted. You know, he's not leaving a perfectly harmonious relationship pattern. He went through serious, serious setbacks, serious controversies. And yet he has, you know, these relationship significators in what is considered good placements. So every chart has genius. But if you look, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its life believing that it is stupid. You know, that's an Einstein quote. And the same thing, if you expect, you know, a Mars in Cancer to be a macho and to um, 
to be outspoken, then no, you know, it's going to feel like it's failing. But if you direct that Mars in Cancer to swimming or, um, you know, soldiers who will defend their countries, uh, people who will be, you know, very family oriented, things like that, then it's going to be exalted. Then it's going to bring the best out of it. And I'm not saying every Mars in Cancer is good and every Mars in Capricorn isn't. I'm just saying they both can produce the successes, the genius, and they both can crash into really dark places. What will determine one or the other is how you use it. And earlier in life, you know, we don't have yet the perspective to make different choices. So quite often we learn the hard way when we're younger, but as time goes by, we learn, you know, to better understand what the plot is. So this is just the example, you know, this is the chart of Michael Phelps with his Mars angular on the ascendant. It's the, you know, the apex of a yard with Jupiter and Uranus and sixth house Uranus, you know, has to do with physical prowess as well. So you see that he made it. He made his Mars in Capricorn. And then this is an example her army hammer, uh, who's this very handsome and successful actor who was born with, again, same as Woody Allen, with Venus in its own sign of Libra and Mars in Capricorn. And yeah, he has the Venus in Libra, extreme charisma, and, you know, the the, the pretty Virgo, Venus in Libra boy, but he, you know, it was revealed, alleged that he was involved in very, very uh, destructive and abusive scenarios of extreme dominance and submission. And so I'm not judging people who are into s &M, but what I'm saying is there was pattern of abuse, you know, as, uh, situations where that Mars in Cancer was over, uh, Mars in Capricorn was overpowering and <clears throat> situations where there were uh, crisis. So we, you know, as, as astrologers, as evolutionary astrologer, our job is to say, no, you know, the fact that Venus is in Libra doesn't mean that you're going to have the best relationships. It means that you need to learn equality in relationships. There's an intention. It means that, you know, you tend to over-idealize others, sometimes to the point of overcompensating and losing yourself. And then as a result of doing that, um, you may end up being angry because you're losing yourself, things like that. So we're looking at the chart and we understand the pattern and then we help our clients use the energy of the chart at a higher level so that <clears throat> you know they can have better circumstances, better jobs, better health, better relationships, better life, hopefully. Um, planetary cycle represent changing developmental climates. How we respond to planetary influence is our responsibility, which, you know, this is basically not blaming the planets for your misfortunes. You know, I have a bad chart. That's why, you know, I can never do this. Um, or I can never get married or I can never be you know, financially secure. <clears throat> Don't blame your chart. This is part of the free will factor. And yes, 
there are things that your chart will direct you towards and not others. You know, if if you have certain patterns that that show that you would be really good as a carpenter rather than be a cook, you know, you don't have to prove your chart wrong by forcing yourself to be a cook. Because the more you resonate and understand your chart, it feels natural. You will want to be a carpenter. So the chart is, re is a reflection of you. It's not forcing you into something you're not. And so when we are in tune with our chart, when we see even, you know, not just looking at planets, but asteroids and fixed stars and all that astrology can dive into, there's always a shadow side and an exalted side. That's the premise of evolutionary astrology. Now, religious institutions have turned against astrology because they did not want people to blame planets for uh, their misalignments, bad deeds. <clears throat> you know, they say, you are responsible for your salvation. And, and so they turned against astrology one of the reasons they turned against astrology was that um, that it takes, you know, that people can use it to to a, a, avoid responsibility. But this argument is only valid if we perceive astrology as deterministic, as its fate. You know, the planets were aligned in a certain way, and I didn't have a choice but to kill this person. Blaming on Mars. So we are fated to planetary configurations, but we can alter. Um, we have the agency to express this at a lower or higher frequency. And now, you know, even if we speak about fate and the fact that we cannot change our charts, you can change your next life's chart. Because whatever you learn in this life will determine what happens in the future life. That's my study of death charts. When I look at death charts, the, you know, the time that the person expires in this incarnation, we can see what has been resolved, what they're still working on you know, where they're at in this next step. And so depending on that free will factor of how much you've done, how little you've um, compromised, whatever has been, you know, on your plate, whatever you've managed to accomplish will determine, you know, the conditions for your next step. The same way our current birth chart is an echo of what we have accomplished or not in the past. <clears throat> now, importantly, evolutionary astrology encompasses a diversity of technical approaches to chart analysis. It's not one formula. We've talked about all these guidelines. We've talked mostly about an approach not how to interpret Saturn. So what technique you're going to use um, can vary from astrologer to astrologer. Generally, there's a strong focus on the nodal axis, and it's in plural because we have the lunar nodes, but we also have planetary nodes. Prior lifetimes are assumed, Every chart component is viewed as a signature of the soul's evolutionary course. We look at the whole chart to see where you're at or where we're going. But specific methods of interpretation vary from one practitioner to another. So I was trained, as I said, with Jeffrey Wolf Green, and his focus was very strongly on seeing Pluto as the soul. 
But it's something, you know, in my own experience that I ended up not fully concurring with, not fully identifying with when I do the chart. Because for me, looking at the whole chart is where the soul is at. Whereas Pluto is the evolutionary impulse. It's that impulse to change, to expand your vessel of consciousness. And so these nuances can vary from practitioner to practitioner. And Stephen Forrest, you know, uses a different house system than I use. And, and so we're, we're not locked into, you know, you have to do it this way. It's more of a model of growth. And yes, there are, um, you know, methods of interpreting how a particular configuration is going to um, be expressed in a lower frequency or a higher frequency. And so all these principles that we've just went through, and this is the last one, um, reflect basically what evolutionary astrology is about and how it can be used by analyzing charts without locking you into um, don't use perfections or should you do horary or the, things like that. <clears throat> you know, I, I do horary in an evolutionary way. <laughs> How is that possible? I mean, it is possible because I'm going to cast a chart for a question, but I'm going to interpret it according to Maurice's perspective and following some of the guidelines. And, you know, at the end of the day, what matters is, does it work or not? And of course. So, it's a growing body of knowledge. And, you know, it's a body of knowledge that welcomes new perspective as long as they are tested and reasonably validated. You know, there is a lot of uh, criticism towards um, growth-oriented types of astrology because the argument is that people, uh, practitioners can come up with all kinds of um, interpretations and, and definitions. <clears throat> and so, you know, we should rely on what has been tested over many years, over centuries. And obviously I think that's very limited. Uh, but there is truth in that you cannot just make stuff up. Right? Um, and that's also part of experience and working with clients and doing proper research. <clears throat> and, and so spending years to see how things work, to see how your astrology matches reality, your reality and your client's reality can lead you to new conclusions. But we have to be very vigilant about not just coming up with stuff. So there is openness and growth and evolution within the field of evolutionary astrology, but it needs to come with credibility, with rigor, and um, proper analysis. And again, proof is in the pudding. It has to work. So <clears throat> other points that are not part of these nine guidelines that I'd like to address, that evolutionary astrology is considered to be a modern approach to astrology because this growth-oriented approaches to chart analysis gained traction in the 20th century. So it's relatively modern. The Theosophical Movement uh, of the late 19th century birthed humanistic astrology by Dane Rudyard and Alan Leo, who, you know, really advocated for a 
growth oriented approach. You know, Alan Leo was persecuted for fortune telling and he went to trial and he had to defend himself. And one of the things he says is that I'm not doing fortune telling because I'm not doing deterministic astrology. I'm not <clears throat> looking at astrology only from a fate point of view. So just like we're doing, you know, analyzing the future of the weather and we can see patterns, we're looking at probabilities, not finite outcomes. So, <clears throat> You know, this is a movement that has indeed developed in the nine, end of 90 and early 20th century into psychological astrology, you know, the Jungian approach to astrology. Um, but, you know, the, the truth about evolutionary astrology, about the evolution of consciousness is nothing modern. This is timeless. So it's it I just want to you know mention how this term modern astrology is not you know can be misleading because it it comes you know with the assumption that it, it all it's something we we developed we made up you know only in recent time and it doesn't have precedent but these philosophies and way of life are actually very ancient. And people, you know, who lived in uh, antiquity and in different, through different civilization had tremendous spiritual knowledge. And we can anticipate, assume that if they used astrology, they understood growth. I mean, Plato spoke of the soul and the evolution. So that's not in the 20th century. It was revived in the 20th century. So modern is with quotation marks. The other assumption that you can often hear about evolutionary astrology and growth-oriented approaches is that because we use free will and not fate, um, you know, these astrologers tend to always look at the positive side and they... Um, you know, they, they don't pay attention to the painful realities. And this, again, could not be further from the truth because evolutionary astrologers are going to look at the shadow. And there's always an acknowledgement of how something can be misused, can be badly interpreted. And so planetary configuration, you know, it's not because you have a Jupiter trine that you are going to be wise and that you're going to uh, know what you're doing with your life. So it's absolutely not true that evolutionary astrology wears rose colored glasses. Um, and yes, you know, there is definitely an understanding that if we go through pains and if we face challenges, there is a context. It's not random. So that's true, but that doesn't take away the fact that there is an opportunity for learning and improvement. So, you know, this kind of cliche you know, that astrologers will always say, well, there's a very good reason why you're going through hell. Think positive. You're evolving your consciousness. You know, this is what we call spiritual bypassing. And it's not, you know, the foundation of evolutionary astrology. It could be, you know, spiritual bypassing can exist with anyone, any system. So just you know, rectifying some of the misconceptions. And again, for a greater understanding of what this wonderful, effective, deep and spiritual approach to life, to astrology is. Because one of the beautiful thing about evolutionary astrology is that it looks at the soul 
at the spiritual side of life, but to answer practical questions, to answer, you know, the most practical dilemmas of, you know, how to function with my life, how to find the right job for myself, how to resolve my financial situation, how to, you know, uh, work on my relationships, how to, you know, should I be in a relationship or should I withdraw? So it looks at the big picture perspective to address the details. It's not about, you know, talking above people's heads. And so on this note, <clears throat> if you are um, interested in private consultations to understand your evolutionary journey, or if you want to study more thoroughly, as I said in the beginning of this talk, the world needs more qualified astrologers, number one. And I will say, as through my own bias, the world needs more evolutionary astrology practitioners, competent ones. So consider taking this seriously. Consider answering this deep call for perhaps your higher destiny. And I would like to thank uh, everyone and Stephen Forrest for, you know, helping uh, compose these guidelines. I want to reiterate that the guidelines are a mutual uh, exploration and, and definition of these concepts. All the afterthoughts and the explanations are things that I use to, you know, speak about where I'm coming from. So I don't want to speak in his name in that sense. Thank you and many blessings.